Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can see my screen and everybody can hear me. So welcome to today's webinar. The topic of today, as you can see, um, is communications for automated monitoring. And before we start, my name is um, Christian Ardenschein. Um, I'm product manager for different monitoring products. I'm based out of Munich in Germany and have been with Trimble since 2011. Today, my co-presenter is David Ward. David is a very experienced colleague and I'm very happy that he shares some of his knowledge today during this webinar. Um, David, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, I'm David Ward. Um, I'm a technical support engineer with the Trimble Advanced Positioning Support Team. I've been with Trimble since 2008, and I'm based in the US. I have over 30 years experience working with installing and repairing radio and network communication systems. And I'm licensed by the US uh, Federal Communications Commission with both commercial and amateur radio licenses. Great, thanks David. Let's have a look at our agenda for today. So I will start with an introduction before David um, runs us through a couple of communication scenarios. And um, towards the end, I will, I will point you to some resources that are available around Trimble monitoring. And I will also give you an outlook um, on the next um, webinars and the next power hour sessions that will come up soon. And of course, we will also at the end, uh, we will still have time for questions and answers, but um, it doesn't mean that we need to wait until the end of the, of the power hour of the webinar um, until we can discuss um, or answer some of the questions. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please um, just type them in, in the, in the chat window, and we will address them as we go. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we will try to um, follow up afterwards. But um, ideally, we can, we can answer all of your questions uh, while we go. Okay, so communication. Communication is, is really a, it's a critical element um, of, of monitoring. Um, this is because, I mean, the main purpose of an automated monitoring system is real-time alarming. In case something moves, you just want to get informed. Um, it's not just movement, it can also be something accelerates or let's say, general speaking, generally speaking, um, if um, a certain value exceeds a, a predefined um, threshold. So this is, this is what you're looking for when you um, install and set up an automated monitoring system, right? Um, so what is communication? Communication is the act of transferring information from one place to another. Communication involves at least one sender, a message and a recipient. So if you now think about monitoring, um, a sender can be seen as, as a sensor and the message that is actually transferred is the sensor data, and the recipient is our monitoring software, Trimble 4D Control. So now if you look at that image here, um, the sensor in this case is the total station that sends data over um, to T4D, Trimble 4D Control. Data is basically the observations that the uh, total station takes. and um, the communication in this example is established by the help of a USB cable. So looking at this, looking at this picture, you might wonder, okay, what, what is the challenge here and why is it actually worth to talk about it, right? Um, the reason is quite simple. So what you see here is, is really by far not uh, representing reality. So in reality, the communication between a sensor in the field and the software that is typically in the office and not next to your sensor, um, this can really be a, a challenge. And um, I would 
like to show you some examples of, of real monitoring installations. So monitoring sites can, can really be located in remote areas where you have no where you have not much um, communication infrastructure by default. And um, so this this I mean this becomes quite obvious if you look if you look at the images from our monitoring sites here in one is in Norway and the other one is in the US. Um, one is, is about a GNSS receiver and the other one there you can see a total station and a weather station but it really looks like it's in the middle of nowhere right and you can easily imagine there is no um, communication infrastructure available. Um, but even in, in more urban areas um, like here in this example from, from Italy where you see a total station next to a, um, a rail station or a rail track um, so even here um, the communication part of a monitoring system is not as straightforward as it as it might look like. So um, I mean despite despite all of, of the possible challenges um, we are still going to talk about and David will, will run us um, as I said through a couple of scenarios. So despite of all of those um, challenges a communication can always be established in some way. So data is eventually flowing from the sensor into our software Trimble 40 control. And um, as you might already know, because you already, because you are already a user of Trimble 40 control, or because you attended previous monitoring webinars, T4D again, our software solution. Um, for automated real-time monitoring, processes the data that are coming in. It does um, all the uh, geodetic processing of total station data, of GNSS data, and um, it has a rich feature set for um, charting time series. Uh, you can create an analysis. Um, it um, automatically um, creates um, reports, and it also triggers alarm notification if something happens on site. So this is this is a Trimble 40 control in a nutshell, just in case you are not familiar with it. To summarize, uh, we have all kind of, of applications out there. Um, like um, on this slide, um, you can see a building represents maybe a, can, re can represent a construction site um, in some urban areas. Um, Monitoring is also used um, on a dam, for example, or on a bridge. And um, yeah, with all with all these applications, um, we use different sensor types. The typical sensor types that are used um, are total stations, GNSS receiver, and geotechnical sensors. And um, all of the sensors are deploy deployed on site in the field, whereas uh, Trimble 40 control is typically installed in the office, right? So, I mean, there are a lot of, of different types of communication, in fact, and um, types of communication, again, to transfer data from the sensors over, over to the office, to the software. And um, yeah, David um, is now going through a couple of scenarios and explains how we can best establish a communication for those. So this is the topic of today, um, connecting the field with the office. All right, um, let me check if there are any questions so far. Um, um, how to set up T4D? Um, receive SMS on a cell phone is one of the questions. Um, so to receive SMS on a cell phone, so you can, um, you can, this is basically not the communication between the sensors and, and, and the software, what is, what is displayed here, but it's, it's a good question. So you can, you can define um, in Drumble 40 control, um, there is, there is um, notification settings where you can where you can um, select um, certain SMS providers which are available, and um, and uh, then you can specify uh, 
to which user an alarm notification should be sent based on the uh, cell phone number you have typed in once you created this account. Right. I hope this answers your question. If not, uh, maybe maybe you can you can raise a follow-up question. Um, other than that, I cannot see any more questions so far. And um, yeah, with that, I will hand over to to David. David, are you ready? Let me I'm let ready. me make you a presenter. Okay. All right. Now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. So today uh, we're going to cover a series of somewhat representative communication scenarios, uh, which we've seen in some installations. We're we won't be able to cover all the possibilities, but we hope that these will give you some ideas that you can use in your installations and let you know that you're not locked into one method of transferring the data from the monitoring location to the T4D control software. There are always complications of getting the data from the location where it's being, where the monitoring is being done back to the T4D control server. And we hope that this presentation will give you some ideas to work with and getting through the complications. We will be discussing specifically uh, total stations and GNSS receivers, but there are also possibilities here for the geotech sensors, uh, weather station data, and any other remote data that you need to bring into T4D control. In our first scenario, we're going to uh, talk about a building construction uh, site where we've got a monitoring project going on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the site is not large and we have a total station monument that's near the location. This is our easiest scenario, right? The, uh, the, T, the T4D control server and the total station are within Ethernet uh, length of each other within 100 meters. So we don't have to put in any additional Ethernet repeaters or additional switches or equipment. We can just run a cable out uh, to the total station through a conduit. In this case, because we're going to use straight Ethernet, and the total station requires serial communications, we have to use a converter called the device server. Uh, this one is a MOXA 5200 uh, in type, and uh, it just converts Ethernet to serial and serial to Ethernet. There are also device servers that connect Ethernet to USB. In this case, because we're also we're using Ethernet, if we put a switch out or um, a router out by the total station, we can co-locate a GNSS receiver, in this case, the Trimble alloy. And the uh, alloy, <clears throat> excuse me, would have its own IP address and could be addressable over the Ethernet. In our second scenario, we're going to talk about a bridge monitoring project. Imagine a bridge. We've got an office building when we can, um, like a construction trailer or something that's got a server sitting in it, and it can see the entirety of the bridge. So there's no barriers or obstructions in between, but it's too far for Ethernet. It's more than the 300 feet or 100 meters that uh, is the maximum for Ethernet. So in this case, uh, we can use a 2.4 gigahertz radio. The Trimble 2.4 gigahertz radio connects directly to the T4D control server. And 
it can and it interfaces with uh, and controls and communicates with total the total the, excuse me robotic uh, total stations. If you uh, are using radios, one radio can control up to five total stations, and you can have more than one radio connected to the T4D control server software. If we need more range, you can put an external antenna on the radio by adding a coax and uh, running it uh, up, giving it more elevation. Our uh, third scenario, we've got an earthen dam we're monitoring. Due to the location of the dam, there's no cellular connectivity and the distances are much too far for Ethernet communications. This is way out in the middle of nowhere. There's no cellular. Uh, it's just uh, totally isolated. So to complicate matters, we've also got hills in between where the T4D control server is located and the total station. So there's no direct visibility. But what we can do is use what is called an Ethernet or IP radio. This radio uses Ethernet protocols, and we can, they can be connected into a network when, they're, when you have uh, two or more. They effectively become an Ethernet range extender. Because we don't have direct line of sight communications, we can also add another radio configured as a repeater, uh, and this would be able to relay the data between the two locations. These types of radios are configurable as point to point or multi uh, point to multi point, so that you can have multiple legs in the Ethernet radio network. And you can also use various external antenna types for better signal data transfer. Again, because we're using Ethernet protocol, it's very easy to plug a Trimble Alloy receive, GNSS receiver in and uh, have that data be used for the monitoring as well. Are there any questions so far, Christian? Um, no, not really. No, okay. no. All right. So in this situation, um, we had a customer with a pit mine. It's a very rich gold mine, so they've got cellular towers out in this very remote area, which is uncommon. And they also have very good internet connectivity so, uh, so they can reach the web and communicate back with their head office. There are hills here, so the distance and visibility are a challenge to connect. What, we'll, what the customer ended up doing was they purchased a cellular modem that had serial um, adapter connectivity so it could be able to connect directly to the total station. And that way they could bring the data back through the cellular towers into the Trimble 4D control server. Again, um, because they chose which model cellular modem they had, they had one that had Ethernet cap capability as well. And they decided to go ahead and put a GNSS monitoring site uh, there as well. Hey David, um, yes. sorry for interrupting. Um, so now we have just received a question. Um, it is regarding the cellular modem. It's a question about security. Okay. How do we how do we maintain security protocols? Um, can you can you elaborate on that one? Sure. Um, I'm seeing your emails, motives. David. Huh? I, I'm seeing your emails. Um, you're off the wrong screen. Yeah, uh, I, I don't. I I somehow clicked the wrong button. <laughs> no worries. 
So, so it was about um, how so, do we maintain security protocols? That's the question, yes. Right. So with um, cellular, cellular modems, some manufacturers have built in uh, protocols like uh, VPN, uh, virtual private network that you can integrate with your uh, existing system, with your existing network. And um, that would give you a private tunnel for the communications and uh, uh, likely prevent uh, external intrusion into your network. I don't have a specific list of equipment because depending on the location and cellular providers, the exact security needs might be different. Um, there are different regulations and different equipment standards and protocols, so I don't have any recommendations for specific equipment for different scenarios. Okay. Yep. Thanks, David. I hope that answers the question for everybody. I hope so too. Otherwise, um, I will follow up on that one when I see something coming in. Thanks, David. Okay. All right. Um, our next example is the same mine a few years later. They had a they have the same situation. They've got Ethernet network protocol cap uh, access, uh, internet access. They still have the cellular towers, but they had a failure of one of the cellular tower, and they lost communications for over a month. So they had no data communications uh, transferring into T4D, no monitoring happening at all. And so they came back and said, "What can we do?" Uh, to maintain 100% data connectivity. So we recommended in this situation the Setop M1. The Setop M1 actually controls the total station and has a uh, a target file that's in is loaded into it and it runs the rounds and records the data into it. And then T4D control server reaches out to the set-top M1 and downloads that file for uh, processing. So what happens if we have communications go down now? The set-top M1 is still running without any outside control from Trimble 4D control. It's still recording the rounds. And once communications comes back, once that cell tower comes back up, T4D control downloads the rounds files and they can then be processed. So this gives us our, even if it's delayed, uh, continuous uh, processing of data. So, our next scenario is a tunnel project. No radio communications are going to get into the tunnel. Uh, no um, visibility down the tunnel from the location where T4D control server is running. So, what they did was they said, but we can put Ethernet down the tunnel and we can probably put uh, Ethernet amplifiers to extend the cable beyond the uh, 100 meter maximum link down the cable. Because this is a very high profile project, they wanted to maintain 100% reliability of the data. So they went with the set top M1. But because they didn't have cellular connectivity. We used the set-top Octohub to connect the set-top M1 to the Ethernet. <clears throat> so the set-top is still running the rounds itself, and T4D control is only downloading files. But if we lose connectivity, if the 
modem uh, went down or what, I mean, uh, if the router went down or whatever, so we had no ethernet into the tunnel, the set top would still be recording the rounds. Um, um, David, yeah. David, um, here we just got another another question. I think um, this was triggered um, when you, now that you're showing the, the OctoHub, um, it's about the, um, the configuration, I guess, and the question is, um, does it require an, an, an IP address? Um, so the combination between Setup M1 and Octohub. Um, um, so I'm not sure if the question is, is clear, but um, so maybe you can just um, talk a little bit more about this, why you need the Octohub and the connection or the, 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 the yeah. So um, the Octohub is, uh, the, the Setup M1 does not have an Ethernet uh, capable plug on it. So we have the OctoHub, which is an interface adapter that gives us the ability to connect uh, several ways to it. And one of those methods, it's just got an Ethernet connectivity uh, to allow the Setup M1 to connect to an Ethernet network. The Setup gets programmed with the IP address and the OctoHub does not require its own IP address. It is just uh, a pass through. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think that answers the, the question. Okay. Thanks, David. All right. So if the network fails, the setups recorded the rounds into a rounds file. And when the network comes back or is restored, T4D control can then download the rounds files uh, for processing. Our uh, next scenario, it was a landslide and it was a very high profile landslide. They had, well, this monitoring project's got to have 100% data. It's a government funded project and it's uh, beneath the major coastal highway. So we have to uh, maintain 100% of the uh, data reliability. The total stations down below the cliff monitoring the, uh, the uh, fall area, and there's no cellular communications. There's also no visibility back to the T4D control server location. Um, of course, the distance is way too far again for Ethernet connectivity. So what we did was we used the Ethernet radios that we saw in a previous slide with the Setup M1 and the Octahub. So we can maintain again 100% data connectivity because the Setup M1 is actually running the rounds and logging the data. And if the communications fails for any reason, if our repeater uh, battery dies, the solar power went down, whatever, we have 100% connectivity. Uh, when it comes back, the uh, server downloads the files and uh, T4D uh, processes the uh, rounds data. Any questions so far? Um, yeah, there's one question, um, but I think this goes back to the comment I I already made on the um, SMS notifications. So, oh, okay. So, so it's from. Sasulan, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, so can you throw off detailed instructions how to do it? So how to basically um, uh, configure um, the SMS provider and how to configure that someone receives an, an SMS if there is an alarm. So um, yeah, we can certainly um, provide you with detailed uh, instructions. Um, 
maybe uh, not during this webinar, but um, this is this is really uh, straightforward in our T4D web application. Um, so yeah, I, I can I can follow up on that or our our support team maybe um, after this webinar. Um, so I guess this is nothing we can answer now. Um, I don't have a screen of, with T4D to log yeah. in the show right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe you um, continue with um, scenario seven. Um, maybe we can okay. discuss one. Well, scenario seven is just finishing, and okay. I have. Uh, okay. I'm going to talk about. Oh, I somehow went too far. There we go. Um, so we can look at networks and all the possible different combinations. We can do uh, clusters or whatever. Uh, look at the star scenario. Say we had a, a T4D server where this word star is and the center or the hub would be a repeater and it could communicate with multiple uh, units uh, in the uh, multiple total stations. Or the same with the cluster. You can use multiple repeaters doing point to multi point um, and have them talk back to uh, the T4D server. So now we have talked about a bunch of possibilities where we have different uh, network configurations. We have multiple TOLO stations, multiple GNSS receivers. We can incorporate communications legs with that are wireline Ethernet, Ethernet radio. Um, or have some of the legs uh, be cellular or network, or we can also ensure data capture and storage in the event of communications outages with the set-top M1. So by using a combination of radios and repeaters, wireline, Ethernet, and cellular, we can create uh, data, transport the data, and process the data uh, to monitor and analyze uh, your project in the T4D control software. If there's no questions, then I'm going to go ahead and pass this back to Christian. Uh, actually, there is um, at least um, at least one. Um, I think is uh, definitely you can comment on. Um, so you were talking about um, yeah IP radios, let's say. And so um, the question is, um, do you have a list of, of manufacturers for the IP oh, radios? Yeah, there are a lot of different manufacturers for IP radios that have a lot of different capabilities. Some of them are uh, have um, multiple Ethernet ports on them, two uh, or three or four. Um, they can have one or two serial connectors on them. Um, the thing is, because there are so many manufacturers and every country has their own radio communications regulations uh, specifically, I, I don't keep a list of what radios are available for what country, right? So it'd be very difficult to uh, keep a database of, of that type of thing. We can recommend them on a case-by-case -case basis um, if we are provided with communication standards of the country or whatever, you know. But or but we're always willing to assist the customers in trying to figure out their best network configuration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. All right, thanks, David. Um, so there is um, there is actually a couple of more questions. Um, uh, one of them. From Martin Gonzalez, um, does setup can store temporarily GNSS data also or only total station? So yeah, maybe I can just um, reply on that one. That's um, so the setup in one is um, is made uh, for for the total station connection. Um, so you can, um, as David um, just said, or said a couple of minutes ago, you can you can control the total station using the setup M1, and it can also buffer um, observations and um, 
yeah, so it's for the communication of a total station to Drumbo 40 control. That is what a setup M1 is for, and um, so it's not it's not about GNSS data. Um, no, the GNSS receivers store their own data in exactly. log files, mm -hmm. and T4D can download those using the storage integrity option for uh, reliability, data reliability there. Yeah, that's that's perfect that you mentioned this. Um, so as you just said, David, um, maybe um, I don't know how many gigabytes you can actually store on the different variants of the NetR9 receiver. I think it's two, four, eight gigabytes or something. And it's as you say, you can you can still retrieve um, um, missing uh, GNSS observations that way. And typically, you would connect a GNSS receiver um, via Ethernet to Trimble 40 control. Um, and um, the reason why I'm saying um, it's good that you mentioned it because there is just another question I see um, from uh, Fabien. Um, this time it's about the uh, setup M1, the storage capacity of the uh, setup M1. So, for instance, um, he writes, "How long can we store with one total station and around uh, 20 targets?" So. Um, mm, yeah. So, so the setup M1, um, maybe maybe you know it better than I do, David, but um, it has a huge onboard storage. Um, I think it's at, least, uh, it's at least one gigabyte. That's what I was about to say, yes. Um, and um, so one gigabyte of, of uh, round information of, of um, total station measurement. So this is really a, a lot. So um, I, I do not expect that someone really hits this hits this limit of one gigabyte. Um, otherwise, they're not with just yeah. 20 targets. Uh, no, it depends no. also on how much how often the rounds are taking place, right? But uh, yeah, even but, so, but, that's a very small so. file with only 20 targets. Exactly. So, so let's let's put it that way. So, Fabian, if you reach that uh, one gigabyte uh, onboard storage of the setup M1, uh, then we are then we are dealing with with um, with other issues than um, than buffering files on the setup M1, <laughs> because that would mean you would like buffer one year of data or so. I cannot say it for sure, but um, a lot of data at, at least. least so then several not, months, right? <laughs> then it's then it's not an automated real-time monitoring system anymore. No. So it's it's plenty of onboard uh, memory, so you can buffer your data. That's for sure, right? Um, okay, what else do we have here? Um, 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 so. Oluropo, Oluropo. Um, again, I hope I pronounced it correctly. So there is the question uh, for the dam monitoring project. If the location of the total station is too far from the T4D server and there is no internet connection in that area, how do we communicate uh, with the server? So I guess I guess when you when you say there is no internet connection, I guess you mean there is. Um, there is no cellular coverage, for example, and there is also no um, Ethernet connectivity. So that's that's what I uh, understand from this question. And I guess then it's about um, then you can still establish um, a radio connection with maybe some repeater. But um, David, maybe that's that's something you can. Oh yeah, you yeah. Can so add more. Uh, you could even use multiple repeaters it, it tied together um, uh, or linked over radio so that they can uh, hop the data back to the server if there's more than if there's too much um, ground between the server location and the main thing is to get the data back to an ethernet port right so that we can get it into the internet once we've got it into the internet we can get it to the server if the server's at a location where there's internet right so we can use various methods but uh the two radios or three radios doing hops would uh, uh definitely be able to do it yeah okay all right and um i see there's one more question from alexander um what is the usual estimated cost per monitoring station or sensor Ooh. okay so so this is um this is a difficult one to answer. First of all, I'm not quite sure if you are referring to the 
to the cost um, for connecting it to the software, in fact, or if you're referring to the um, cost for the physical device. But in any case, I mean the the costs. Um, it's not it's not that one price. It re it really varies, right? So if we are talking about um, geotechnical sensors, so the price uh, level is 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 really low, let's say, compared. To, um, compared to um, total stations and GNSS receivers, where it's a little bit higher, of course. Um, but um, even with uh, total stations and within GNSS receivers, there is a huge variety of different types of receivers and total stations. So this is why it's it's really hard uh, to answer that question. Um, right, and I, when I, you're I, talking I, about a site, uh, are you talking about the powering equipment or exactly. and the communications equipment and the monitoring equipment the sensors and monitoring equipment um what are what monitoring equipment are you putting at the site is it a total station in conjunction with a weather station or yeah so a monitor site can be any number of things and the the prices can compound depending on how you configure it exactly so alexander i would i would um i would recommend if you're looking for um a specific price information regardless whether it's um the the actual sensor or if it's some software component or some communication piece whatever um i would suggest uh, maybe you reach out to the um to your distribution partner and um so um i'm sure they can provide all the information to you in more detail okay um so i'm looking again here um um there is one question uh, you can from Tsasulan you can do online learning um so uh yes we can do that um um I think Tsasulan you are also so you also raised the question about uh, the the notifications SMS notifications so um I'll get back to you offline right um I'll get back to you and um okay so i think um that's pretty much it for now at least um please um raise more questions if you have some um i will just uh, make me as a presenter again um yeah. um Okay. Are you a presenter? No. No, I should be. Can you see my screen now, David? Yes. Okay, which one? Communication methods? Just yes. to be sure? Yeah, okay, yes. perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, um, hang on, something is wrong here. Uh, yeah, so um, the communication methods, um, this is more like a summary, this slide, uh, the communication methods um, um, we have covered. Um, so it includes Ethernet, uh, radio, cellular, and as David um, illustrated, each of them has, has different options. Like uh, for a cellular connection, you can, for example, use a, a regular modem, or you can also use the uh, setup M1 and um yeah so it's i mean in any case it's i think david uh, really nicely demonstrated that with um one with one or a combination of of this uh, communication method you can really create the connectivity you need for your monitoring application right so david had one slide where you could see um the setup m1 was connected to an octohub and the octohub again to a radio um, so you can really benefit from the advantages of the setup M1. At the same time, you can use an Ethernet connection and you can even um, transfer data via radio in this combination, right? So it, it can be a combination of multiple com communication methods. And even if the um, monitoring side is, is, is remote, very remote, where you don't have any infrastructure for communication, uh, we can still we can still uh, get it to work. Um, um, it, of course, it requires some some planning, but um, all is possible. 
And um, I really hope that um, this, um, this session uh, provided you with some good overview about the different methods we, we have in place and we can use in combination with, with T4D. Okay, um, so I would like to um, provide you with um, an overview about our Trimble monitoring resources. Um, um, so feel free to, to go to your browser and open monitoring.trimble.com. So this is our, our website. And on that website, you can really find a lot of information, helpful information an overview about all of our products, the solutions. Um, you can um, read um, about uh, different customer projects. Uh, there is also a link to different um, monitoring demo sites. So basically um, to Trimble 4D control, uh, where you can also get an impression how the software looks like. And um, yeah, so of course you can also reach out to us um, via this, this web page, our website. So I can just encourage you, maybe you wanna have a look at, at the site. Um, apart from that, um, we also have a monitoring YouTube channel. If you open YouTube and you type in Trimble monitoring, um, you can subscribe for it. You will also be notified as soon as there is a new video. I think at the moment we have, um, we have almost 50 videos available, uh, videos that are short tutorial videos. Um, one of them uh, coming back to your question, uh, Tsazulan, when it was about um, SMS notifications. So one of uh, of the videos, I'm not sure if it's already included. If not, that's sh that uh, should be one um, we will work on shortly. So a two or three minute video, basically, that uh, quickly shows you how you can um, how you can configure um, an SMS gateway or how you can make it happen that someone receives a SMS notification uh, from T4D. So this is just the idea of this uh, YouTube channel and there's really a lot of helpful information covered already now and it's still growing. So we, we add more videos over time. Um, there is also a monitoring community um, where we also share um, um, new news and um, yeah, um, latest releases and all kind of information in there. Um, so that's also available. And um, now that we are um, the, the Trimble Geospatial Webinars page, so this is a website uh, that you can open. Um, um, so there you can check for upcoming webinars and um, you can also find the webinar recordings. And um, I think it's on the next slide. So it's geospatial.rimble.com. You will see it. Um, you will see it on the next slide. So there you will find a lot of information about about the webinars. And this one here will also be included. So you can also watch the recording afterwards um, if some communication scenario, for example, wasn't clear to you. So you can still watch it. And um, one one good resource, and um, this is maybe. Um, uh, still one of the best resources um, is the Trimble distribution partner. Um, um, as I just said or commended um, to Alexander's question regarding uh, the cost per, per sensor and monitoring station. So I would, I would uh, strongly recommend that you reach out to your Trimble distribution partner if you are interested in a certain topic around Trimble monitoring. All right, so the um, next monitoring power hour, similar as today, um, with a different topic, of course, will take place on October 14th. And in this monitoring power hour session, um, Lee Helen from Monitum um, will share, um, yeah, let's say an industry um, professional perspective um, based on, on Monitum's journey with automated monitoring systems. So monitoring is uh, is a company based out of Australia. And um, I'm sure Lee will give us a very nice overview and some insights on how they started and how they have used um, T4D to, to help elevate um, their professional service offering to what it is today. So I would really, I would, I would be really happy if we can also welcome you to this session in October. 
All right. Um, so now let me check if there is some more new questions coming in. Um, uh, no, I don't think so. I think we have already covered pretty much all of them. No, there is no new question. Um, so if there are no questions, then I would like to thank everybody for your time and for joining this webinar. Thanks to David, um, it was very, very interesting. Thanks for sharing your expertise. And um, again, if you have any questions around any particular topic or specifically on communications, um, uh, we are happy to assist and to, to answer your questions even after this webinar, of course. So just reach out. All right. Um, so David, do you have any final comments? Anything you... <laughs> Uh, don't I've I don't missed. think I have any specific comments. Thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. So then, um, thank you again, and talk to you next time. Bye bye.